Let's talk about sex. This magnificent male peacock spreading his tail feathers is one example of how organisms go to a lot of trouble for sex. Big flashy things that may encumber an animal when it comes to escaping predators can be of great benefit when attracting a mate, and it's definitely worth it fitness-wise. A number of organisms propagate asexually. The drawing of the plant is the walking fern, which makes little plantlets on the tips of its leaves that um, lower to the ground and root, and the older plant eventually dies. The new plant grows, makes babies on the tip of its leaves, and so can walk across the landscape each little plant being genetically identical to the parent plant. And outside your front door here in Miami, you might have little geckos that are parthenogenetic females. They look like they have eggs in the side of their bodies, but those are really little babies forming that are genetic copies of their mother. In most vertebrates and many animals, the sexes are different when it comes to resource allocation for reproduction. But for any individual, fitness is measured in the number of descendants, and each offspring is the product of a sex cell from each parent to haploid cells, egg and sperm, combined to make, well, they combine in fertilization to make a zygote that grows into a new individual that's diploid. This simple diagram shows how two distinct parents with different um, sets of chromosomes, different genes, produce gametes that combine to make <clears throat> offspring different genetically from the parents, whereas a parthenogenetic female produces offspring that are genetically identical to their mother. Some organisms have both sexes. While this sounds unusual for vertebrate animals, since we're used to our gonochorus single-sex human condition, animals have this, and of course it's the norm for most plants. So the female symbol, the cross beneath the male symbol, the arrow above, a hermaphrodite is symbolized with both of those things. And so a parent with both sexes can contribute genes through both its female and male function. On the left we see hermaphrodites producing both kinds of gametes combining in all those ways, and on the right two distinct single-sex individuals producing gametes, which combine all of these offspring have recombination independent assortment of the genes and so are genetically distinct from their parents. It's good that the genotypes are rearranged because as the environment changes there's a continual supply of new variations, some which may be better suited to survive and reproduce. For any organism, the changing environment includes resources as well as competitors, predators, and parasites, which are all evolving at the same time. So it's a kind of arms race, if you will. If all the individuals of a species are exactly alike, that species would quickly lose to its competition or predators. So the genetic variability that results from sex definitely has an evolutionary advantage. Here are a couple of examples of organisms with armature that protects them from their predators and on shells of gastropods. Many shells have cool projections and shapes that make them especially hard to crack or penetrate. So imagine if these species reproduced exactly the same offspring as the parents, predators could evolve st 
more strength or different methods of penetrating the shell, soon conquering and eliminating that species, whereas if they reproduce sexually, some may be um, able to be eaten, but others may be strong enough to resist. I like this picture because it shows how many different interactions are affected by the benefits of sexual reproduction, not only the macroscopic things we can see for these plants being eaten by herbivores, but benefiting from pollinators competing with each other, and the microscopic things, diseases and viruses that also attack them. So we mentioned hermaphroditic individuals before. Let's make some definitions here. Species that have single-sex individuals are gonochorous, or we can call them also dioecious, two houses. Others have hermaphroditic individuals with both sexes. So why have separate sexes? It appears that when the costs of sex are high, or the sexes compete for resources. Sometimes separate sexes have been selected. In, pl in animals, sometimes it's too expensive to have that additional sexual apparatus to haul around or to reproduce in both directions. So often animals are gonochorous with single-sex individuals. But for plants, which are sessile, attached to the substrate, not moving around. Hermaphroditic is the norm because the male function is usually much less expensive than female, so it's more economic to have both. Here's a big, beautiful flower on a tiny little plant in the pine rocklands. The pineland petunia in the genus Ruellia, has a perfect flower with both male and female parts. These little white things ringing the center are the male parts, the anthers that hold the pollen, and then the female part is this little um, cross-shaped stigma where pollen is received. Some plants are dioecious, however. Here in Miami, you might find growing Ecclusia, the so-called autograph tree, because people have been known to carve their names into the long-lived leaves. From a distance, these flowers look the same, but looking closely, you can see the one on the left has a sticky, resiny surface. That is the stigma and yellow things around, which are actually staminodes, fake stamens, to help the flowers look similar between the two kinds of individuals. On the right is the male, with a ring of functional stamens producing pollen, and in the middle, just a gap where the female part is on the other flower. Many mollusks, these are invertebrates, are hermaphroditic. But these red pandas, like most furry mammals, vertebrates, are gonochorus. There's a male and a female in this picture, but I'm not sure which is which. And in fact, in many species, males and females look alike, except for their genitalia. And in some animals, those are hard to see. So in a population, to have the same numbers of males and females, an even sex ratio one-to-one -one, is standard. If one sex is rarer than the other, it will have greater fitness because there's less competition with its own sex to mate with the other sex. Let's look at an example. For If we have 10 males and 15 females, and they mate to produce 150 offspring. If each individual is the product of two gametes, or maybe we can even say the product of one mating episode, each male would contribute 15 sets of genes, and each female 10. 15 times 10, 150. So the sex ratio selection is influenced not by 
the number of individuals of the other sex, not by the number of progeny, but instead the number of grand progeny produced, the number of they are the reproductive fitness, in fact, of the children affects the sex ratio selection. So the economics of sex ratio is affected by which sex is cheaper to be produced. And that sex should be in greater proportion. This can also be affected by differential mortality of the sexes in response to conditions of the environment. And sex ratio in populations is modified by evolution to maximize the fitness of a species under prevailing conditions. And sex ratio theory predicts that female mammals should produce male offspring when things are good, but their litters should be female dominated when conditions are harsher. I love this picture of a frisky Sifaka lemur mother with a baby on her back. So I want us to think about how environmental conditions could affect sex ratio and why might more males be favored in good times and more females in hard times for many animals. A number of ectotherms, poikilothermic animals, have temperature-dependent sex determination here in South Florida, alligators and turtles. The position of the egg in the nest, the amount of heat from the sun or cooling from the water it receives determines if an egg turns into a female or a male. In haplodiploid organisms where fertilized eggs become female that are diploid unfertilized male, Sex ratios can be controlled by the queen in response to the environment. And so the females control the sex of their offspring by allowing the eggs to be fertilized or not. This is found in ants, honeybees, which are social insects. So another thing to consider when we talk about mating systems is that Adults of both sexes are selected to obtain as many high-quality matings as possible. So what makes a high-quality mating? The female makes eggs and provides for the offspring. Sometimes the eggs take a lot more resources than sperm, but very often females are involved in some stage of maturation of the offspring. So for males, the, their only concern is the number of matings, and so there are many more sperm produced than eggs. In oogamy, the breeding system where eggs are larger than sperm, the females increase their fecundity by having more resources to produce more of these gametes that require more energy whereas males increase their fecundity simply by producing more sperm and having more matings. Mating systems vary from one extreme promiscuity with each individual mating with as many other individuals as possible to at the other end monogamy. Monogamy partners for life or for at least a breeding season, is most common in species with prolonged offspring dependence on the parents. In between these are different kinds of polygamy with one sex mating with multiple individuals of the other sex. So in polygamy as well as monogamy, males cannot contribute to female fecundity by sharing offspring care or getting resources for the female and their families. There are two kinds of polygamy. We hear about polygamy in certain human cultures and the most common direction 
is for one male to have a number of wives. And strict, the strict definition of that is polygyny, many females, one male, many females. But there are also species in, and maybe human societies where polyandry exists, one female with many males. In this picture is the red-winged blackbird, which is a polygynous species with males defending territories, and males with better territories get more mates. Gordon Orion's put forth what's been called the polygyny threshold hypothesis, um, predicting that males with multiple mates should occupy better territories than those of monogamous or unmated males, so that females mating with them gain from having a better place with more resources to mature the babies in their nest. So this figure shows how the quality of the territory um, varies with the number of mates so that there is a line, this dotted line, that is lower when resources are abundant and higher when resources are scarce. So many species are polygynous, but some are also polyandrous. Let's think of how polygynous mating systems work. Maybe an example would be lions. But think also and look for examples of any that are polyandrous and how does it work in different situations. If you can't find any, then make one up and think of any evolutionary advantages. As I said before, males can contribute to female fitness by caring for offspring or providing resources. Males are more likely to do this if they're more certain that they are the father of the offspring. In species with external fertilization, with some fish, for example, there are many rituals that have evolved, like nest preparation and then guarding of the females. In dragonflies, like this little clip art, males mate with females putting in a spermatheca or sperm packet that will fertilize the eggs when the females lay them, and subsequent males scoop out the prior male's spermatheca. With animals that have internal fertilization, the certainty of paternity is lower unless the males guard the female during the fertile period.